Well, thank you very much, Paula. And thank the audience who have personally made the effort to come here this evening in the cold. And uh, thank you for the people who are making the effort to watch at home. I consider it an honor to be able to have this time with you in order to share some reflections, some thoughts that I think will be of uh, value, certainly of relevance to life today. The Buddhist views on sexuality and marriage. I think if I had uh, incorporated in that title something about Tantra and Tantric yoga practices, I may have drawn a larger audience, uh, but that is not my intention. I do think that the Buddhist teachings in regards to our human condition, we are human beings living in a sensual realm. We, we call the human realm a sensual realm because we experience uh, feeling through the senses. And the Buddha was also a human being. He did not claim to be uh, a god, a son of a god, or a prophet of a god. He claimed to be a human being who had achieved something quite extraordinary through his own effort. And what he claimed to have achieved was complete enlightenment. And complete enlightenment may mean different things to different people. What it meant in the way that the Buddha used that term was that he was free from all forms of craving, aversion, delusion, freed from all fear, freed from any desire to partake of future rebirths. And so he said that this life that he led 2,500 years ago, in which he was known as the Buddha, was his last life. Now, that is not to be taken just uh, as belief. You can question it. Certainly you're invited to question it. However, and I, he was quite an extraordinary man in that he taught for 45 years and inspired a great deal uh, of confidence in a large numbers of people. He did not have a chosen people. He taught for all people. And his purpose in teaching was not to lay down the law and give commandments to people in, to, in regards to what they should or should not do in regards to uh, what they should believe or not believe. Rather, he set forth a teaching which he said encouraged questioning, encouraged investigation, not to be accepted blindly. And this purpose of this teaching was to help fellow human beings arrive at the same insight and understanding that he had arrived at. So by offering that teaching out of compassion, he did inspire a great following. And it was a following that transcended the usual barriers in a society to do with status or education or political position. It was across the board, uh, as he taught through the Ganges Valley in uh, northern India, which was quite a large area for that time. Of course, in, you know, when you think of it as a, in comparison to the whole world, it's still a small area. But the point being was that his teaching was not specific to a particular tribe, ethnic group, culture, uh, sex, belief system. The intention of his teaching was that it was universal to the human condition. That's what he focused his teaching to. To that extent, we as human beings should I think, find something also relevant to us from these teachings. And in regards to this 
hot topic, sexuality and marriage, which is hotly debated, in, in particularly in America for some reason, much more so in most other, well, no, there probably are other countries where it's equally hotly debated, but many of the other Western countries, uh, European countries, it's, it's nowhere such a hot button issue as it is, seems to be in America. It's, it's so ingrained in, in our political um, debates. This whole issue about sexuality and uh, marriage and what it is. And there's a lot of rigidity in it and I think a lot of confusion about it that I hope some of these uh, views of the Buddha or teachings of the Buddha may help uh, resolve to some extent for some of us. Um, so this talk this evening, what I'm hoping to cover is the nature of sexuality. And, you know, it's what part it plays in life, its benefits, its limitations. Um, the various forms of sexuality, including homosexuality, what is, you know, heterosexual, homosexual, and uh, non-sexual, if you wish. So, you know, try to contemplate the spectrum there. And then the role of marriage and what marriage is in, from the Buddhist perspective. So I'd like to begin by just saying that the Buddha, uh, though, you know, we think of him as this holy man, uh, before he set off on his uh, ascetic quest at the age of 29, certainly had a, a great life of, uh, a life of great luxury and indulgence. It is said that he, was, he had um, exposed and provided with all sensual pleasures, every whim that he could have. And being a prince, one could expect that that was probably quite extensive, the amount of uh, indulgences that he could partake of. So he wasn't an innocent uh, kind of holy priest who was uh, quite ignorant of the ways of the world we could assume that he knew what the world had to offer. And he claimed uh, uh, so much. He said, as to regards sensual pleasure, I know the benefits of it. I know the limitations of it. I know the dangers of it. And I know the escape from it. And when we say sensual pleasure, that is the pleasurable experience we can derive from life through our five physical senses. And sexual experience, sexuality, is derived through one of those senses. It is the physical sense of touch. And we derive pleasure from seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting. And that's the range of our uh, field of receiving pleasurable experiences from the world. Of course, it is experienced subjectively in the mind. And it's a very subjective world when we talk about the mind, how it feels to us. But we devote a great deal of effort and a great deal of time and a great deal of um, commitment to try and maximize the amount of sensual pleasure that we experience in life. It is the great driving force. It is an instinctual force of all life. Self-gratification, self-preservation. That is what drives. And if you think of the vast advances that have been made in science and um, all fields of human endeavor, increasing, maximizing pleasure, comfort, and trying to eliminate discomfort and anything that is uh, associated with pain. Yeah, that's why we have these nice comfortable chairs and you're not sitting on a hard rock. And we have heat and we're not sitting outside shivering. We have a roof over our heads. We have clothes that keep us warm. This is pleasure, 
pleasurable to us. So the Buddha understood all this, and there is nothing wrong with it. Experiencing pleasure is not a sin. And Buddhism doesn't have the position of uh, the extreme positions in regards to any uh, pleasure, that it's bad or that it's good. In actual fact, to be quite frank, when one is experiencing a pleasant experience, pleasing, pleasant, pleasurable, enjoyable, we say that is the result of your good karma. Of course, we are creating karma all the time, and sometimes people, uh, in experiencing the results of past good karma, end up creating bad karma in the present. But when we experience pleasure, that we are comfortable sitting in a nice warm place, we, we, this is the result of some good karma, that we are not uh, homeless and destitute and starving and being tormented and tortured, as many people are experiencing at this very time. That we are not the ones laying in a hospital bed right now, suffering from some uh, pain, discomfort, of sickness. So this is good karma. If you have a body with the five physical senses in good order, that you can see and hear and smell and touch and taste, and then you experience pleasant things through these senses, that you see beautiful things, you taste beautiful, t delicious food and smell fragrant smells and odors, and experience pleasant touch through the body. If you are in a sexual relationship which is gratifying and fulfilling to you, and uh, brings a lot of joy and pleasure to you, we say that is the result of good karma. So we don't view this as uh, anything bad, evil. And sexuality is not seen in this sense that it's dirty or bad or wrong, that's not the point in Buddhism. It is to understand how to relate with our human sexuality, how to understand it, how to live with it, and, if we choose, how to transcend it. So this is what the Buddha set forth in his teachings. Having uh, seen the limitation of the sensory world. That was his enlightenment. He realized the limitation of what conditioned existence can give. And he saw that limitation so clearly that he lost the thirst for conditioned existence. And we say non-attachment, relinquishment, and his enlightenment was the freeing of his heart and his mind from that craving, the desire to be, to have, to experience within the sensory or conditioned realm. Now, his thrust of his teaching then was to point that out to other people. And many who heard his teaching were so inspired, they wanted to do exactly what he did. And what he recommended to them was, you know, you've heard these different sects of Buddhism, the great vehicle, the little vehicle. Well, what he actually taught was the speedy vehicle, <laughs> the fast and speedy vehicle, the direct vehicle. That's what he taught. He taught the Eightfold Path, and in particular, if you wish, the intense form of it, for those who wanted to really commit themselves fully to that training. And that speedy path required quite a degree of uh, specialized conditions, meaning the relinquishment of a lot of distractions and complexities and responsibilities so that one could devote all of one's effort, all of one's energy, all of one's time, all of one's enthusiasm 
to that goal, the practice for enlightenment. So those people who were thus inspired to follow in, in exactly in his footsteps, with regards sexuality, what the Buddha said, renounce it and lead the, what he called the brahmacharya. Brahmacharya is usually called the pure life, but really what it, it relates to is a celibate life, or, but it's even more than that. It's a life that is no longer putting priority, not, no longer giving priority to sensuality. It's giving priority to purity and the moving towards purity of mind. So that those people who wanted to really train on this speedy vehicle, speedy track, if you wish to call it, became monks and nuns. Uh, and they undertook certain rules of conduct, certain rules of um, discipline, lifestyle, that were conducive. We call the brahmacharya, they led celibate lives, they renounced eating, uh, you know, being preoccupied with food, being arms mendicants, being content with whatever food one is given, eating only once a day. They gave up entertainment. They gave up singing and dancing, family and uh, social preoccupations, so that they could live very, very simply in very... Uh, quiet environments where they could really cultivate meditation. And so the brahmacharya that the Buddha encouraged for his, if you wish, really fully committed disciples, monks and nuns, was one which renounced preoccupation with sensual seeking, seeking of distraction in sensuality and focused on a contemplation and meditation to cultivate, and this is what is very important, to cultivate the purity of mind that brings joy and bliss that is far more refined and more, uh, well, it's, it's just more blissful than the happiness or the joy that, or the pleasure that comes from the sensory experience. And so this was the intention of the Buddha, to encourage the renunciation of preoccupation with sensual pleasure and committing oneself to a training of mental training and discipline within a lifestyle that is quite disciplined and restrained, so as to be able to train the mind to arrive at deep states of meditation, which he said was a joy more refined and surpassing that, that the sensory world can give. Now, some monks had great difficulty in doing that. It isn't hard for some, but it's very hard for others. Uh, not everybody who had the desire to follow the Buddha was capable of following the Buddha. So the monastic order in Buddhism was an open order. If somebody found the going too hard, better for them to leave rather than to live it in misery and poorly. So there was, it's nothing, again, it's not the uh, vow for life, it was an open order. But the purpose of it was to make it as convenient and um, as maximizing the possibility that the human being could really cultivate the Eightfold Path in its fullness to reach the highest goal, which was first the bliss of deep meditation, which could be used to attain deep insights, which frees the mind from all attachments. Okay, so that was his main thrust. Now, obviously, not all these people who met the Buddha wanted to become a monk, either 
had no inclination, had no desire <laughs> or little desire or little ability to renounce what to some of us is still very valuable, you know. Pleasures are still pleasures. <laughs> and so many people don't feel the inclination to renounce the lay life, to become uh, an alms mendicant, so committed to the speedy path. To that extent, the Buddha you know, it's, oh, it's, it's up to the individual. There is no compulsion about it. Tread the path as best as you can. And so in regards to being a lay person who still was inspired by Buddhism, what sort of life did they live? And in particular, what was the Buddha's uh, guidance? What sort of guidance did he give through his teachings in, re in relation to sexuality, in relation to family, in relation to um, community living. So the, the Buddha had one primary mission, but that overlaps with he, another area of his teaching, which we call the teaching in uh, morality and virtue, for the cultivation of harmony and well-being. And this is, a lot of the Buddhist teachings are like advice and pointing out that the way we live, the choices we make, the karma we create, this is all the same thing, has consequences. And if we are circumspect, and if we are wise and consider the relationship between our choices and our actions and the consequences, we will be able to make wise choices in regards to how we live, and in regards to how we relate with our own bodies, in regards to how we relate with others, in order to create as harmonious, peaceful, happy, life as possible. It will never be perfect, but it can be relatively more happy, harmonious, or much, much less. And so their Buddha's teachings in this regard um, relate to every aspect of life, everything that we do. So it's not that uh, some forms of some aspects of life are spiritual and other aspects are not spiritual. That is, not, that is a, not a necessary or a wise, useful distinction. What we do in life is all shaping our future, is all having a, an effect on ourselves, and others. And to that extent, every choice we make is part of us, our evolution, spiritual evolution. So it's everything we do. Sexuality, the Buddha certainly recognized the power of this. He did say, and he spoke about, you know, he often because this society in India was a uh, male-dominated society at the time, and it was just a convention to speak in terms of a man first, say. But it equally applies to a woman. He said, nothing stirs the mind of a man more than the sound of a woman. Nothing stirs the mind of a man more than the smell of a woman. And he went on, and then, then the uh, touch of a woman. So he certainly recognizes the power of sexuality, and the true, of course, the opposite is true in regards to a woman. So it is more than, um, you know, the normal, it has a power that's uh, ingrained in us, instinctual in us. However, I would question even that that the Buddha said. I'm not sure I agree with it, actually. 
a starving man will be stirred much more by a loaf of bread than the sight of a woman. So it does depend on time and place. So that general statement uh, it is true to indicating that as sexual human beings, as sexual creatures, we, th these urges are strong and they need to be understood. But, you know, human beings can live quite well for, you know, people can live celibate lives for all their lives, 50, 60 years, and be quite healthy and happy. Very few people can live without food for 50, 60 years and be quite happy, <laughs> or without water for that matter. So, you know, actually, it's, it's putting it in perspective, but given that sexuality is such a big thing, you know, and then in our culture, in our Western culture, we tend to either go from one extreme to the other, which is typical, you know, like either this complete permissiveness where we somehow um, you know, we, 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 we make sexuality far more than it is. Exaggerate it. Make it far more by the f power of commercialism and uh, imagination and fantasy. Because it's good business. <laughs> or we've got the, the prudish puritanical view that makes it into something dirty, embarrassing, disgusting, to be hidden, uh, and something unnatural or, you know, something that should be kept in a closet somewhere. And, you know, that's really silly. Both of these are quite extreme and, I would say, unwise views to hold in regards to a, a very normal human condition. And so the Buddhist position, as usual, is a, a pretty you know, middle way of openness and inquiry. And in regards to sexuality, we should understand it. Yeah, sure. If we choose to be uh, sexual human beings, and we are not uh, wanting to be celibate human beings, then the simple advice is to do so with intelligence and understanding and responsibility. And in this regard, the Buddha suggested some very simple, straightforward uh, advice. There is a precept that uh, lay Buddhists are encouraged to keep, and that is to refrain. And it's never worded in, re in terms of um, commandment. Nobody's commanded to do anything, and nobody commands you to do anything. The Buddha just advises and asks you if you want to take this advice, take it on, if you see value in it. And so the precept is, I choose, having understood the meaning of this and having considered it with some time, I feel that this is a good choice for me. I undertake a training to refrain from wrong conduct in sexual matters. Now, that's quite a mouthful, wrong conduct in sexual matters. What does it mean? And so this is where a little bit of elaboration is, uh, and the Buddha gave some elaboration, whereby he made a list of, you know, what, what is wrong sexual conduct? Well, when you, if you look through the scriptures and you read them, what comes across is a, is a principle that is acceptable by all. And it's really quite, you know, as one would expect, quite an enlightened view on it. He's the, what is wrong is that the sexual relationship should happen or should take place, for it not to be wrong, should take place only when it takes place between people who are free to do so, and freely choose to do so. Now, these are two very important things. Being free to enter into a sexual relationship means that, what does that mean? Well, if one is 
uh, in, if one is married, what this, and I'll be talking a little more about marriage, but marriage, if one thing is you've made a commitment to someone. So that the, the simple understanding is that you've made this commitment, therefore you are not free to enter into sexual relationship with others unless you make the commitment in a very different way than is normally made. If two people get married and they say, we're married, but we can have sexual relationship with others. Are you all right with that? Yes. Are you all right with that? Yes. Okay. So they're free. But being free means that you are not a, you have not entered into some agreement, such as marriage or engagement or a commitment to someone else. Or you are underage. You are not old enough to actually, you're not mature enough, old enough to make that choice. So you're still under the protection of your parents or guardians. So you're really, you know, we say that children are not really free to make that choice. And each society will determine when is a child old enough. It's a civil, you know, when is a child old enough to make that choice? It's kind of a <coughs> difficult area to decide. And you can't decide it for someone else. But certainly one would think that children are just not aware enough, responsible enough to enter into that relationship. Uh, they don't, they're not free to because they're still under the guidance and protection of their parents. The other one is if one is under uh, the protection, it says under the protection of a king. In other words, you're in some sort of a, arrangement with somebody that you are not free to just do what you want with your sexuality. Now, if a person who is not free then engages in sexual, sexual uh, activity, we'd say that's wrong. It's like uh, adultery is wrong. Why? Because that person is married. They made a commitment. Is it wrong because the sexual act is dirty? No. It's just wrong because it's transgressing an agreement and it's going to cause problems and, and it's going to cause a lot of distrust and, and uh, disharmony. It's bad karma. <laughs> That's all. It's bad karma. Is it a sin? It's, it's, it's bad karma. It's missing the point is one of the uh, uh, definitions of sin is that it misses the it's missing the target, your target being wealth, being and happiness. And you're going up, you're doing things that are going to be bringing about problems and suffering. So there, the person has to be free. Adult can make the choice, not committed, is open to make the choice. The other one is they freely make the choice. In other words, there's no compulsion. There's no compulsion from power, from aggression, from monetary pressures, from all the things that may be used to leverage power over an individual to enter into that sexual relationship without their full willingness to do so freely. That makes it wrong. In other words, it's bad karma. And this is something that uh, I think I'm, I'm glad to say that our society has come to terms with, that you can actually have uh, a case of rape within marriage. Just because you're married to somebody does not mean that the sexual act is uh, something that is now your right. <laughs> It's still a willingness. There has to be the free to do so and willing. So this is uh, th th with regards improper sexual conduct. It would mean those two factors, are, one or the other, are missing. When both are met, is it all right? Well. Adults can agree and, and 
uh, can agree and uh, engage in sexual relationships and it's if from the Buddhist view it isn't seen as anything either wrong or bad or uh, sinful it's not necessarily seen as edifying or, or exalted to anything special it is a choice that human beings can make so that is the uh, position with regards just the sexuality in lay life the next little stage of uh, controversy or controversy is homosexuality and in this area the Buddha doesn't say very much actually there isn't a lot of uh, discussion however there is uh, the lack of instruction is in itself not a problem because he treats it you know sexuality as sexuality it's all grouped under the same category and uh, I would apply exactly the same standards you know I would apply is it is it are they free to enter into that relationship do they enter into it freely I have no problem uh, there is no uh, in, in uh, Buddhism there is no, no reference at all to indicate the um, demonizing or the uh, denigration of homosexuality there's just no reference to it at all in that manner it's never been cast as something evil, bad, uh, unnatural um, there's just no, that, none of that stigma associated with it and I don't think that homosexuality is more or less prevalent in Buddhist countries than in Western countries where so much is made of it okay. so it's a pretty um, you know open view about it and in regards to coming back to the monastic life where the uh, the monks are required to be completely celibate uh, if they do break that rule and uh, parte uh, and um, engage in any form of sexual relationship any form of sexual uh, intercourse and it, it doesn't matter whether it's with a, a man with a, a woman or in whatever manner it is it's all grouped is exactly the same it's sexual intercourse the monk is no longer a monk he's disqualified and so it's it seems to categorize all forms of sexuality and sexual um, intercourse in the homosexual and heterosexual in exactly the same light and we apply exactly the same standards with regards whether it's um, you know whether it's wrong or right if you wish whether it's conducive to harmony and well-being or whether it's conducive to uh, conflict and suffering within human relations marriage in Christianity we consider that uh, a sacrament you know we all uh, you go to the uh, when a wedding and it's often the case that they talk about the um, you know um, ordained by God that a man should marry a woman and you know, for this that sort of language and it's all traditionally there's a a lot of it's a religious sacrament and therefore a religious rite uh, and it's a lot of uh, it's not a, just a marriage between a man and a woman it's you know something to do with God which is quite again you know quite foreign in, in Buddhism it was never the case in Buddhism uh, the Buddha you know didn't uh, monks are not allowed to have anything to do with m people getting married they're not allowed to arrange marriages that they, they don't marry people uh, they, they can give a blessing but they can give a blessing to anybody anytime for birth for marriage for death for housewarming for <laughs> you know just well wishing maybe give some teachings but monks don't perform uh, marriage because it is considered uh, marriage is seen to be an agreement between adults people who choose 
to enter into this contract, as it were, making a, a serious commitment to live in a relationship where they will share and their lives together with a sense of responsibility and a sense of entitlement. And in Buddhist countries, usually that sort of commitment is made as a, in a civil setting. It's a, like a contract. And, but there is the social aspect of it that it, it is registered, it is uh, acknowledged by the society because it's important within a society. Those two people enter into a, that agreement and it's important that the community acknowledges and respects that. So there, is, there are ceremonies and there are legal issues and these may be peculiar to different countries. And from the Buddhist perspective, one cannot say that uh, monogamy is the requirement or the only form of uh, marriage that is possible. I mean, there's just no indication of that. Um, however, the predominant practices of most Buddhist countries are of that nature. And if one reads the Buddhist uh, advice as to how you know, that relationship should be structured, you know, because once again, how we live will determine the quality of life and uh, the choices we make will determine with how much harmony we have in our lives, how much um, comfort we have, how much peace we have, how much happiness we have, or how much conflict, how much distrust, how much um, suffering we have. So th the Buddha often taught uh, in relation to marriage well, you know, what is a, a good attitude to have if you enter into this agreement? And it should be entered into, once again, between people who are free to do so and freely choose to do so. Uh, the idea of forcing people to marry or uh, any sort of compulsion, it, it would be contrary to the Buddhist principles. But it is very touching, you know, what the Buddha you know, suggests in regards to marriage. You know, a good husband should, uh, first of all, be faithful to his wife. He should be courteous to his wife. He should uh, give power, give over power to his wife. Not meaning power over him, but make her unequal to him. And give power means that you don't own the wife, that you are not, the wife is not your servant. You give her, a, you give her authority, you give her respect. And it's in a, as a fellow human being, uh, as a partner, not uh, a possession. <laughs> and you, you honor your wife in treating her this way, and you show it by giving her gifts. That's very touching. Yeah, buy a dozen roses, take it to your wife every now and again. Bring her gifts. It's, it's a very good thing to do. And in the wife thus treated, then treats her husband accordingly, is faithful to her husband is respectful to her husband, is courteous to her husband, helps look after the uh, property that is acquired by the husband or by, that comes to them, helps to fulfill the needs of running a household or what needs to be done to make their lives more enjoyable, more pleasant. So this is, is this a holy marriage ordained by God? God is just not in the picture. It is two human beings. Can it be three human beings? 
one would have to say, yes, it could be three. It could be, but it's very hard. You know, living with, living with yourself is very hard, as most of you already know. Some of you are married, and you will also know that living with another person is even harder. Now, bring in a third person, and you can start to imagine, you know, how hard it's going to get. Human beings being the way they are, monogamy or a marriage between one, between two people is not the only way, but maybe it's the most workable way. <laughs> it's the, the easier. I heard that in, uh, you know, because we know that in some other religions they, uh, they actually allow for a man to have many wives. There's few, very few religions that allow a wife to have many husbands, but there are some societies where that does happen. These are cultural things. It's not ordained by God. It's not ordained by... So it's cultural. It's dependent on the environment, on the conditions of that society. In a society where there's a shortage of women, and for one reason or another, it may well happen that one woman will have more than one husband. In a society which is very tribal and they want to grow their, their tribe very fast, it may well be that a, a man will have more than one wife because they can procreate more and have grow their tribe, which is how these things come about. It's very mundane. There's nothing spiritual in the sense of it being ordained or special. It's just choices that people make. Some of them are good and some are foolish. Now, with regards uh, the you know, the religion that well, I was thinking of was in Islam. They allow a man to have up to four wives. But I did was very intrigued to be told that that is so only if the man can treat his wives equally and so that they all feel treated equally, not equally bad. <laughs> <laughs> equally, I'm, I'm implying, you know, I, I understand it to mean that they all feel perfectly contented with the arrangement and they're all willing to live within that arrangement and they find it conducive. Otherwise, they would get out of it which they should be allowed to, because we don't, again, the other thing in Buddhism, that we don't think that, you know, this marriage ordained and sacred is, in, you know, uh, permanent. If it is not satisfactory, if it in any way it is not conducive to the well-being and there is an agreement to dissolve it, it's dissolved like many other agreements, but it's not to be done lightly. Every commitment should be made with sincerity, and one should do so having weighed the, all the factors very carefully, so it's not like, oh, well, we'll get married, oh, yeah, we'll get divorced. That's trivializing something very important in life. And if we, when we trivialize then we trivialize ourselves. We trivialize the value of the human being. So we should do so with consideration and careful consideration. But this marriage is an agreement that it does, uh, it, it does have a tremendous impact on the stability of a society because of the natural consequences of marriage, often of the raising of children and the stability of the family, and the stability of the relationship of a man to a husband and wife is so, has such an influence on the stability and the well-being of the children, and therefore the society. So it is a, a very important decision, and one which should be entered in, into with clarity and sincerity, and then it's up to one to make it work. And the marriage is between those two human beings. And it doesn't involve uh, some outside power. And the society and the 
married couple are part of a whole. And so there, there's the supporting of each other is very important. The respect that the, everybody in the society respects that marriage and the vows and the commitments. These are all very important uh, considerations. Now the last thing I'd just like to broach on briefly is the hot topic of um, gay marriage. From what I've said so far, I guess you can pretty well <laughs> anticipate what my position on that is going to be. I mean, there's just no, uh, there's not very much said about it in Buddhism. But I, I mean, I did indicate that there was nothing much said about homosexuality, so the idea that two uh, adult uh, males or females um, of the same sex choose to live together in a committed relationship and, and share their lives with full, uh, you know, full commitment, it seems pretty normal to me. I, I don't have any problem with it. And from my understanding of Buddhism uh, and Buddhist teachings, I, I don't see any problem. If they are free to do so and they choose to do so freely, who's the, what's the problem? Uh, is it going to disrupt and um, cause havoc in a society or in a community? I, I don't think so. I just don't, I don't see it. Is there a danger that the vast majority of human beings will become uh, infatuated with their own sex and then will stop reproducing and there'll be the population of the world will all of a sudden uh, collapse? Uh, it's highly unlikely. It hasn't happened yet and, and there's no indication of that happening. But we've got enough people anyway <laughs> for a long time. I mean, people often raise that objection to uh, the monkhood and, and people becoming monks and nuns. Well, what about if everybody became a monk or a nun? You know, what would happen to the human race? I guess it would be pretty peaceful. <laughs> but it's never happened. I mean, it's ridiculous. These, these notions are so ridiculous. Uh, and there's uh, fear, you know, there, there's always this panic and what if? Well, I, don't, I just don't see it. And uh, homosexuals who choose to live together in a committed relationship, I think, uh, deserve as much respect and they deserve as many rights and opportunities as everybody else. And I, I, I think it's just the... Um, you know, it's, it's just an indication of how un unenlightened some views on human existence are as to some of the positions that people, uh, you know, take and so, in, so much intolerance, so much aversion, so much negativity they can generate in, in, some, in, in regards to uh, an issue like this from a religious position. <laughs> uh, it's kind of frightening to me. But my friends, my time has now expired and I've tried to cover, uh, you know, kind of as generally as I could these areas and really would invite some feedback and discussion and questions if you do have some. If you could wait for the microphone if you do have a question. Okay, we have uh, a question from cyberspace uh, from Augie. <laughs> what about divorce when only one wants the divorce? In that case, both partners freely choose marriage to start with, but both do not freely choose to end it, just one of them. That is indeed an obvious, um, you know, not an ob obvious complication, an obvious source of problem, and life is full of them. Uh, but that is true. You know, that's, uh, you can say, well, they freely entered into that relationship, but then for one reason or another, one of the partners just cannot you know, or will not or is unable to uh, continue. Do they have a right to uh, choose to move out of that relationship and seek divorce? One would have to say yes, 
it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's not like there's no suffering involved. There's a lot of problems and a lot of suffering and a lot of emotional um, trauma. But still, you cannot force a person to remain in a, in a relationship or in a marriage if they really don't want to. And it's counterproductive. Just the same as you cannot force monks who've ordained or priests who've taken vows to remain priests regardless of whether they want to or not because all you're going to be left with is dead wood and it's just going to make that uh, there's no good to come out of that. However, certainly one would try and find ways you know, what we talk about marriage counselling and all these fine ways to see if there is a, a way to resolve, a way to make it work. It's not to be dissolved in a trivial or casual way. But if it really is the wish of even one side and only that one side, you cannot force it to remain. It's just not going to work. So you said there's a, a speedy path. The one aspect of it is not to, to have abstinence. And presumably there's a, a non-speedy path that has normal sexuality. Um, yeah. <coughs> is there any, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's statistic, is there any sort of winner in that <laughs> competition? <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot, you know, I. I just made that up, really. <laughs> I just made it up. But it is true. I mean, the idea that the Buddha, you know, he renounced the lay life. He called it the cluttered life. It's cluttered with responsibility. It's not cluttered because it's evil or bad. I mean, just look at your own life. I look at my life. The number of things that we have to be concerned about to take up our time and energy and uh, yeah, okay, why do we have so little time to meditate? Why do we have so little time to contemplate, to be silent, to be still? Because we're busy. <laughs> we're busy with what? With life. Our lives are full of things. So we call it the cluttered life. And he said, well, you know, if, if you really want to m m devote all as many as much of your energy towards this, this one training, you've really got to unclutter. And so in the idea of the monkhood that he established, the arms mendicant, was to unclutter. They had robes, bowl, arms bowl, and they lived in, mainly in the forest. They had no fa they led, you know, they gave up the clutter and the responsibilities, and they undertook this life of simplicity, austerity, and celibacy in order to be able to channel all their energy. So that should be the speedy life, uh, the speedy vehicle. But, you know, it's only so for some. For some, it doesn't work quite so easily. Uh, now, the lay life is less speedy because we, our energy is, is you know, dispersed. However, some, these are just generalizations because there are some lay people who can probably uh, achieve, uh, even in meditation, better meditative states than some monks. Because the thing is, with monks, <laughs> the majority of Buddhist monks are, are not necessarily living the speedy you know, they're not traveling on the speedy vehicle quite so much because they tend to, uh, you know, in, once again, acquire an awful lot of clutter, even in the monastic life. So now you look at monastics in, in most countries and their lives are not quite so simple. They're cluttered as well. They, they may be celibate, but they've got a lot of possessions and 
you know, study and teaching and congregations and administration and status and, and you know, so then their lives become cluttered too. And so it's just a generalization. The idea being that if we've all got limited time and limited energy. Where are we going to focus it? And we make the choice. I mean, I'm not a monk anymore. I was a monk. I'm not a monk and I don't want to be a monk now. And am I really, uh, you know, on the speedy path? <laughs> no, I'm kind of meandering a bit because I enjoy some of my comfort and ease. Another question from cyberspace. Um, what is a pure heart from a bu Buddhist perspective? We could talk uh, about a pure heart in, in various ways. When I said uh, the, you know, the, like the, the Buddha attained perfect purity, if you wish, that his, his heart or his mind had absolutely no trace left. It was the roots of any form of craving, aversion, fear, anxiety, any uh, greed, any selfishness, any attachment, any neg anything negative is eradicated. So, you know, that's kind of the highest form of purity. But we can also talk about the good heart, which is maybe at a different, at different levels of, of purity. Say, just developing a heart of compassion, of one that is, sees others with friendliness and kindness. Uh, that is also a form of a pure heart, as you say, or a good heart. The, the cultivating generosity, the willingness to share of one's time, one's energy, one's possessions, one's knowledge, one's resources with fellow human beings or other living beings. That's a good heart, and that's a kind of a purity. In other words, it, anything that tends to reduce the power of selfishness and greed and hatred and fear, reduce it. We say that is in moving towards purity. When those things are completely eradicated, I guess that's, you know, the completely pure, a pure heart. Last chance, no more questions? Okay. Uh, continue talking about the divorce. Uh, divorce uh, make uh, bad karma? No. Uh, the divorce doesn't make bad karma. It, what makes bad karma is the, the choice, the volition, the intention. You know, when, when, whenever we do something, is it bad karma? Well, it depends what our intention is and what our choices are and how, where we're coming from within us. And, uh, you know, if, if we're coming from either greed or if we're coming from selfishness, if we're coming from, you know, the, the negative state, then it may be bad karma, but when you talk about something like divorce, it's usually not, you know, it's not just one thought or one intention or one, it's like you have to, th it's a choice that we make and most people who make it, it's, it's a result of a lot of factors and they decide that this is the best choice I can make. There are some cases that I'm sure people uh, do so from very bad intentions, but most I don't think do. Uh, no, it's not the act that is bad karma. It's the, where it's coming from that makes it either a wise or a good or a bad uh, form of choice or karma. I don't, um, you know, I don't think we should look at life in such black and, you know, kind of so black and white and rigid because it's very, there's a lot of to consider. And one of the things that I didn't address this evening, one is 
time ran out and also I just didn't think to squeeze it in quickly enough was the, the um, Buddhist position on abortion because that's a, another one that's kind of a, another hot topic and related to sexuality and, and all these things you see and again the, the, the we tend people tend to take these really rigid positions you know kind of a either trivializing it or making it a you know kind of murder you know, one makes life so unbearably uh, difficult, whereas considering it as a human condition and human beings trying to live life and the choices that they have to make according to the, you know, very, the various factors that they are considering is difficult to, for me to judge. Uh, and so there are many things in life that, you know, the individual has to take responsibility for and even when we say it's bad or good karma, it's not like somebody else judging it. It's nobody's judging it. It's not up to the priest or to the monk or to the Buddha or to God or to the devas or the masters to judge. <laughs> it's not their role. If they take that on as their role, they're deluded. Because that's, that's not their role. It's not my role to judge it either. Um, but it is my role to consider my actions carefully and take responsibility for them, and, and the same for you. And it's not like it's a sin or not. It's, it's a choice we make. It may be, you know, it may be positive or negative. The consequences of it usually reflect the choice. But don't feel that you're being judged by somebody or something. You're you. You are the one who has to judge. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm sitting here wrestling with myself to ask or not to ask, and I cannot help it. Um, <clears throat> it's a personal question, and I don't mean any disrespect. I think that your personal story is really one of a kind, and I'm sitting here wondering uh, what makes a person after being uh, 20 and some years uh, a Buddhist ordained monk to leave it all and um, to marry, to become another person. So, again, I don't mean any disrespect, and it's up to you to answer or not. No, that's fine. I've been asked this many times, and it's a valid question, especially when I, when I uh, take on the role of talking about Buddhism, then I, I should be willing to, to, to uh, be frank and open. Yes, I, I chose to be a monk, and I, I think I was a good monk. Uh, and I think I practiced as best as I could under the conditions that I had. And I was actually very successful in the, the uh, opportunities that were presented for me and in some ways required of me that, you know, again, my life as a monk evolved into something that I had not in initially set out for it to be. I, you know, when I became a monk, I, I had no intention of, uh, you know, I had no thought at all about being a teacher or, uh, you know, my sole interest was to arrive at some deep understanding, at arrive at, a, a, you know, kind of an inner state of fulfillment and peace and deep understanding about the nature of this human condition that would free me from any sense of burden or, you know, just like you know, what I heard about the Buddha. And then I had this wonderful, um, you know, wonderfully inspiring teacher. For me, he personified this. And, you know, I, I saw it there and I wanted to emulate and I want to follow and be the, uh, see if I can also achieve that. And I, I tried and I practiced, but at, I would say that one of the 
pitfalls was my success at being good at what I was doing, not in regards necessarily to the actual inner practice of the monkhood, but the, uh, the outer practice of uh, teaching, administering, and administration. And I was very successful, unfortunately, which means that you get promoted to positions and you get put in. And, you know, in retrospect, one should say, well, if you didn't feel you were spiritually mature enough, why did you take that on? And one can question that, and it's valid. And I, may, I shouldn't have, probably. But when your teacher has confidence in you and he encourages you, you kind of think it's probably the right thing to do. So I ended up being in this, these positions of a lot of uh, responsibility, and not only for myself, what was the biggest burden for me was that I was responsible for a lot of other people, and not only responsible for their material, but, you know, I'm supposed to be their spiritual guide, and, you know, I, and it's, it was growing. And so by the end of it, I really felt this inner uh, kind of inadequacy within myself that I had not really, I was, I had not matured spiritually enough. I had not evolved enough to be in that role. And so that was a crisis for me. And, uh, and it was, it became, you know, as the things grew, as more monks, I had more monks to train, I had more lay people, the monastery got larger, the community got larger, that, that burden and that uh, sense of inadequacy became quite unbearable for me. And so I did, uh, you know, in, in more or less in desperation, I took a year sabbatical and, and did some very intensive retreats. But, you know, it's like, it was just not going, it didn't, my mind was not, it didn't have the beginner's mind anymore. And, I, you know, that sense of, once you've got a sense of burden, it makes it very difficult to free the mind from it. Uh, in the end, I, I chose to, to resign. And when I did that, it was just for me personally, to be quite honest, the thought of going back and starting you know, just in, in solitude, I just didn't have the energy or the enthusiasm for it anymore. And I did, I, feel, I felt tired. And I just wanted to be free of that responsibility and that I felt like I'd try to climb a mountain and I'm, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> so I went downhill. Uh, well, that's not a good thing. I, you know, I, I, I knew that it was possible for me to leave the monastic life and I did so with great uh, you know, it was a really difficult thing, one of the most difficult things I, I, I did, because it was a big part of my life. And it hurt many people, it disappointed many people. Uh, but I had no, once I, this, I didn't do it lightly and I had no doubt about it. And I had no regret about it. And I've never had any regret about it. And I don't feel in the slightest way uh, ashamed of having been a monk, I'm very proud of it, and I don't feel ashamed of having this rope either. I, I just, it was a choice I made, and I made it openly. Um, and that's just my choice. <laughs>